15th of February 2002, Queen Elizabeth II said goodbye to her younger sister, Princess Margaret. The Queen never cries in public, but on this day, she appeared to wipe a tear from her eye. Now we're looking at the lives of two sisters who started out as equals. Elizabeth and Princess Margaret are best of mates, very close, sharing in one another's lives, their secrets. But who were forced apart by fate. She knew she was leaving behind her family, she was leaving behind her sister, and things could never be the same again. For the first time, we reveal the real relationship between the Queen and Margaret. The first matter that comes before her is her sister. How shocking that must be for her. She was still thinking, but Elizabeth, I've done everything for you. I've always been supporting you. Where are you now? It's a relationship threatened by love. Very poignant for Elizabeth that part of her happiness creates Margaret's unhappiness. The press. Since the age of 17, I've been misreported and misrepresented. And duty. Elizabeth now knows that if it comes between the crown and her love for her sister or her love for anyone else, the crown has to come first. We discover how their bond was tested by war, crisis, and the death of their father. The veil victim was Princess Margaret, and people who saw her at the time were terribly, terribly sorry for her. She looked like an absolute wraith. And how the crown would drive a wedge between them. Margaret's importance has been completely displaced by her sister. No one cares about Margaret anymore. In May 1934, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret made their first public appearance together and they captured the hearts of the nation. Here were these two little girls in their identical pink coats and little pink bonnets trimmed with roses. It was an identical kind of look. It was the beginning of a relationship that would fascinate the world for the next seven decades. Princess Elizabeth, the eldest, was born in Mayfair in 1926. Baby Princess Elizabeth was front page news here and in America. She was known as Princess Betty. Whatever she wore, primrose yellow coat. Every mother wanted a primrose yellow coat. Every magazine wanted to run a photograph of her. This little girl really was a star in her own right. And in fact, her mother once said, it frightens me that people love her so much. Then came along Princess Margaret four years later. And there began the closest of relationships. Margaret Rose was born 16 days late in Scotland's Glam's Castle in the middle of a stormy night. You might think that a child who'd had so much attention wouldn't like the arrival of a younger sister, but I think Elizabeth was really quite delighted by her younger sister and used to push her around in the pram and show her off. She saw it as a personal present for her. Even though there was four years between them, it didn't seem to matter. They were the closest unit, those two. The Duke and Duchess of York attended as stallholders with Princess Elizabeth and little Princess Margaret Rose, who was making almost her first public appearance. From a very young age, Elizabeth saw herself as responsible for Margaret, saw herself as mothering Margaret. And I think that the relationship made her old before her time. As they enter the building, Princess Elizabeth gives her small sister a protective hand. The sisters spent all their time together at the family's homes, 145 Piccadilly and Royal Lodge in Windsor. Their father, Bertie, was second in line to the throne. And from the beginning, he wanted to create the kind of family he'd never had. Bertie had not had a happy childhood. His father had been very strict. Nannies had been very cruel. And yet he was really determined to have a family life. Unusually for the time, he and the Duchess of York were hands-on parents. Elizabeth and Margaret played in their parents' bedroom every morning and had bath time and bedtime stories with them at night. 
they were the tightest of family units within the broader royal family. They were immensely close. They called themselves we four, us four. That's what they felt, that they were absolutely perfect in themselves, just all they needed. The Duke of York referred to Princess Elizabeth, Lilibet as she was known, as his pride, and Princess Margaret as his joy. Although the sisters were incredibly close, they already had very different personalities. Elizabeth, she was much more self-assured, but shyer and more reserved. Now, on the other hand, Princess Margaret, he couldn't really believe that he produced this little bundle of joy that would come into the dining room, climbing all over him, hugging him, kissing him. Elizabeth played mother, and she was really fabulous to Margaret. She looked out for her, and Coer said, come on, Margaret, we'll do this together. From a picture such as this, you can gauge how the princesses are being brought up in a gentle, unpretentious atmosphere. Margaret Rose, a lively little person of eight, running and jumping over the obstacles in her path, whatever they may be. Elizabeth was more serious, more studious when it came to schoolwork. Uh, she was more dutiful. Bertie in particular expected Elizabeth to be very upright, very conscientious, and he let Margaret be the fun one. We know that when Elizabeth was a young girl, she was too methodical. She used to line up her shoes, smooth out everything, and Margaret used to really take the mickey out of her and make Elizabeth laugh at herself. And like most sisters, they sometimes argued. And there'd be fisticuffs. Apparently, Princess Margaret, being shorter, could go in, you know, for the kill with a good bite or something. They were two normal girls, and they had their rivalries and their jealousies. Princess Elizabeth would sometimes say, Margaret always wants what I want. Because they weren't in direct line to the throne, the girls had privileged but unremarkable lives mapped out for them. The expectation for these two little girls is that they're going to, to marry suitable men, they will start happy family lives themselves, and whilst certainly supporting the core royals, they would live relatively sheltered lives. Elizabeth, at this point, her ambition was to marry a farmer and have lots of horses and have lots of dogs and really be an aristocratic housewife. That's what she wanted to be. When George V was king, there was no indication that Bertie would become king and certainly not that Elizabeth would become queen. Uh, it was almost as if Elizabeth and Margaret were extra royals. Free from pressure, the sisters came as a pair and the world loved to see them together. In 1936, the society photographer Lisa Sheridan photographed the two girls for her book, The Princesses and Their Dogs. These are pictures of the royal family playing together. I think we can almost fool ourselves into believing that this is just an ordinary family. Both princesses lived these idyllic, uh, happy lives. They were never denied anything. But their lives were to change forever. And the inseparable sisters were about to be forced apart. Up to the ages of 11 and 6, Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret lived quietly together. They had the same lessons, the same clothes, the same interests. But on the 12th of December 1936, their lives suddenly became very different. Their uncle David gave up the throne of England so that he could marry divorcee Wallace Simpson. And that meant their father, as next in line to the throne, would become king. Edward VIII had been trained all his life to be king. The Duke of York had never been trained for kingship at all until about three weeks before the actual abdication, it was inconceivable that this was going to happen. And so it dawned on them with the most enormous shock. The abdication just threw them all. It was a seismic occurrence that Uncle David was going to give up the throne. And as Princess Margaret put it to me, because I said to her, how did you learn about the abdication? 
And she said, well, from my sister, who said, Uncle David is going away and Papa's to be king. So I said to her, does that mean you'll be queen? And Princess Elizabeth said, one day. Elizabeth and Margaret's world changed almost overnight. The cataclysmic change from minor royal to major royal, from house to Buckingham Palace, can't be overstated. But it is a huge upheaval in your childhood at the age of 10 for Elizabeth. And already she was a little girl who pushed emotion to the bottom. George VI was very stressed by the job of king. It was difficult, it was stressful. He found it hard. And so their available, devoted father was now changed into someone who was more short-tempered, who wasn't around more. It was really difficult for them. Really, Elizabeth and Margaret had to get on with it and had to get on with it by themselves. Elizabeth and Margaret supported each other a lot during those early days after the abdication. On the 12th of May, 1937, the Duke of York was crowned King George VI and the two princesses were centre stage. They had little dresses designed for them of white lace trimmed with gold bows. Princess Elizabeth's train was slightly longer than that of Princess Margaret. She wasn't happy about that. Why is Lilibet's train longer than mine? The sisters had always been treated the same, but now Elizabeth was more important. She was heir to the throne, and that meant she would need a better education. Princess Elizabeth immediately became heiress presumptive at 10 years old, and it was felt that what she needed to be instructed in was constitutional history, European history, and the man that was chosen to do that was Sir Henry Martin, who was the vice provost at Eton College. The sisters, who were used to doing everything together, were now being prepared for very different futures. As Elizabeth settled down to serious studies, Margaret continued with piano and French in a separate room. The fact was that Margaret didn't have much of an education and she had less and less of one as time went on because all the resources were concentrated on Elizabeth. I was talking to her about it on one occasion and she said, I don't mind telling you it was a bone of contention. I said, well, it was very short-sighted, wasn't it? Because your grandfather, King George V, was the second son. Your father, King George VI, was the second son. You were a second child, but a heartbeat away from the throne Princess Elizabeth inherited. Yes, I know, she said. It's very short-sighted. We know that Margaret felt a bit left out and that in later life, she takes to educating herself because she feels she's missed out on so much. So there was, a, I think, a sense that her sister was now getting all of the attention, was getting this greater education, and that she was an afterthought. She was born at the wrong time, because if she'd been born a generation later, she presumably could have insisted on going to university and developing those skills. Margaret did resent her lack of education, and she blamed her mother for it very much. I don't think she ever quite forgave her, to be quite honest. Although Elizabeth was the centre of attention, their bond remained strong. There was no resentment between them, absolutely none, but that was really Elizabeth putting her uh, emotional arm around Margaret all the time and making sure that Margaret was included. Elizabeth took care that Margaret wouldn't really notice that perhaps she was spending more time with her father. It's sometimes said that she was very jealous of her sister. Well, I have to say in all the years that I knew her, I didn't get any indication of that. But that is not to say that there weren't things that Lilibet had that she didn't. So there were things that she would have minded not having, but I don't think it was jealousy as such. Then, in 1939, things changed again. War broke out, and suddenly the sisters were thrown together again 
as they were shipped off to Windsor Castle, while their parents stayed in London. When the Nazis invaded Belgium and Holland, because they were getting rather close, and we packed for the weekend and stayed for five years. When they dug trenches and put up some rather feeble barbed wire, and the feeble barbed wire, of course, wouldn't have kept anybody out, but it kept us in. Margaret and Elizabeth spent five years incarcerated at Windsor Castle. They had to leave the nursery and go down to the dungeons if there was an air raid, and that was very exciting when they all went down there. The castle was such a landmark, it was open to attack. The war taught Elizabeth and Margaret a lot about depending on each other and not telling anyone outside about their feelings and their problems. Throughout wartime, the image of the sisters united under the strain of war is key. They, uh, they evolve from fairy tale princesses of the 1930s to the evacuated princesses of the early 1940s. They are seen as closest companions, continuing to try and live uh, ordinary lives uh, despite the hardships of war. During the war, the sisters put on pantomimes at Windsor Castle to entertain their family and friends. And Margaret was the one in the spotlight. These pantomimes really are very significant because you see Margaret taking the starring role. You really see Elizabeth generally taking the backup role. And that really reflects who was the better actress. Let's face it, it was Margaret. You expect in the royal hierarchy that the future queen will be get to play the big role. But no, and I think that really showed how Elizabeth saw that Margaret was the one who could shine. Margaret was always the star because she had such personality and Elizabeth was a little stiffer. Both the girls loved acting because basically the rest of their life was going to be one long play. Elizabeth was very methodically minded. She would correct the other children in the play. So really, she was taking the role of director, which, of course, again, she was for the rest of her life. Margaret didn't care, so she could act everyone else off the stage. In public, though, Elizabeth had no choice but to play centre stage. In 1940, she was asked to make her first public radio broadcast, and the shy Elizabeth chose to have her outgoing sister there to help. Every one of us, that in the end all will be well. For God will care for us and give us victory and peace. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. Elizabeth, in that greeting, she describes how she and her sister Margaret Rose, who stood alongside her at the time, they know what it feels like to be separated from their parents. She needed Margaret by her side, a help. She had her as a support, and I think that Margaret was part of it, was really very important to Elizabeth. Princess Elizabeth wouldn't have excluded her sister from it. So even though little Princess Margaret just said, Good night, children. At the end of the broadcast, it was including her. It was an indication of the bond between them. War had made the sisters much closer again. But in 1944, Elizabeth turned 18. Their childhood was coming to an end. Elizabeth, on turning 18 in 1944, uh, she starts to take on more public roles. She's going on public visits alongside her parents. Margaret doesn't join her. At 15, Margaret was left at home in the nursery, while Elizabeth moved into her own suite of rooms and took on more responsibilities. Princess Elizabeth's uh, public image almost changes overnight from uh, one of two sisters. Suddenly, on turning 18, her trajectory transforms completely. She takes on new roles, and there is, a, I think, a growing separation in terms of, uh, of the kind of roles that these two princesses are fulfilling. 
the two different pathways that the princesses are going to move along, they emerge out of the war. And really from the end of the Second World War onwards, we see uh, Elizabeth uh, taking on more and more responsibilities in readiness for becoming queen. But it wasn't just age and a growing sense of duty that was pulling Elizabeth away from Margaret. Elizabeth was in love. And when she fell for exiled Prince Philip Mountbatten, she told her sister all about it. She would have seen it unfolding and Elizabeth undoubtedly spoke to Margaret about it, you know. I mean, they were that close. There's no way they wouldn't have spoken about it. They were always great confidants. Margaret knew everything about her sister, and her sister knew everything about Margaret. Prince Philip, in some ways, was really very similar to Margaret. He was someone who had a great sense of humour and someone who was something of a rule breaker. And that really was very appealing. Philip was really someone who did, to a large degree, like to break convention like Margaret. And in the early courtship of Elizabeth and Philip, she, of course, was constantly escorted by Margaret. Margaret escorted them in the nursery when he came around to visit. Margaret escorted them out, because you can't go without an escort. So Margaret became a third wheel, really. But it wasn't a unfortunate third wheel. Margaret didn't feel like she was stuck there. Actually, it became quite a good friendship, and Philip enjoyed Margaret's company, and it was really quite a fun threesome to go out on the town with. It's interesting that Elizabeth, so dutiful, so responsible, fell for someone who was rather like Margaret. To begin with, Philip joined Margaret and Elizabeth's close relationship. Three of them made quite a good little team, and Margaret was always there. But Philip didn't seem to mind at all. And he was a very sophisticated young man, and yet he was sort of almost playing ball games with these two princesses. But as Elizabeth spent more and more time with Philip, she started to pull away from her sister. Initially, when Philip was courting Elizabeth, Margaret was always there. But as it got more and more serious, it became increasingly clear to Margaret that she would be left out. And it wasn't just Margaret that she was pulling away from. In a funny way, the only time the Queen has actually really operated in a totally independent way, which might not have been the first way that her parents wanted her to, was by choosing Prince Philip. It was a very, very good choice. But they were nervous about him, and they thought he would be a, a modernizer. Well, he was. No one expected Elizabeth to have an independent mind of her own. They thought she'd go on being their princess forever and ever. The idea that just as a young woman, she'd say, no, I want to marry him, that was really a shock. In 1946, Philip and Elizabeth got engaged. But the king asked his daughter to keep it secret until after the family's first trip abroad together, to South Africa in 1947. It would be the last time Elizabeth and Margaret would be together as two single sisters. Because tragedy would soon tear their family apart. Between two lines of warships, led by Duke of York and Nelson, the vanguard steamed her course while ship after ship saluted the King and his family as they passed. This was the first highlight of the voyage, and Britain was now far astern. In 1947, 20-year-old Elizabeth and 17-year-old Margaret travelled to South Africa with their parents on a royal tour. It was their first time abroad. The wonderful film footage of them playing um, it. It's a visual indication of the fun that those two princesses had together. And an indication, yet again, of the bond between them. They were always fun-loving, loving sisters. With Philip 8,000 miles away, Margaret had her sister to herself again. They went riding, attended ceremonies, and went to parties. The sisters were so close. They went to a ball together, and because it was an official 
party. They had to do their duty and dance with everyone. And after the party, they were spotted just chatting away together, laughing about the evening, and just being two sisters together. They sat there and had a giggle and talked like sisters do about the funny people they'd met and Margaret would be mimicking the person that she'd dance with. They just had this intimacy of the two of them. Behind closed doors, she and Princess Margaret are still best of mates, very close, sharing in one another's lives, their secrets. They are normal, young, fun-loving princesses. But although they were together again, there was no escaping the reality of the very different directions their lives were taking. On the 21st of April 1947, Elizabeth officially came of age as heir apparent, turning 21 while the family were in Cape Town. To mark the occasion, she made a speech that signalled the start of a lifetime of responsibility and duty. A life in which the crown must come first. Her speech broadcast to Empire and Commonwealth included these solemn words. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. She made a very clear act of dedication. I think again, thinking back to the abdication, that had been such an awful thing. She wanted to do her duty and she made a very, very firm commitment, something which she's kept evermore. Unlike her wartime speech seven years earlier, Elizabeth made this speech alone. Princess Margaret, whereas in 1940 she had stood alongside her older sister at the time that she was giving the, the wartime broadcast, now Margaret is very much in the background. These are two girls now living very different lives. Elizabeth has reached adulthood. Margaret is only a teenager. She hasn't uh, reached the same level yet and she isn't engaging in the same way. But Princess Margaret would have been listening to that 21st birthday broadcast. Princess Elizabeth dedicated herself to the service of the nation and the Commonwealth. To Princess Margaret, that would have been a brilliant speech, a wonderful speech that she would have admired and she would have admired her sister for it. This was the beginning of a part of the huge responsibilities that her sister was going to have to face and Margaret was not going to have to sit there and make speeches and do all those kind of things that she would have thought was really boring. But her sister was going to have to do it and I think it probably made Margaret feel extremely glad. That, that you know she was the younger sister and that she, she could have the fun but without the responsibility. Margaret's carefree attitude shows in a letter she sent to their governess, Marion Crawford, known as Crawfee. Crawfee wrote to tell them a bad storm had hit Britain when they were away. Margaret wrote back describing the fun they were having. But Elizabeth replied that it bothered her to be so far away and she wanted to return home to help. Elizabeth also wanted to get home for another reason. She had not seen Prince Philip for four months. When their ship arrived in Britain in July, her lady-in-waiting described how the normally reserved Elizabeth danced with joy on deck. She was so excited to be home. On the 10th of July, 1947, Elizabeth and Philip's secret engagement was finally revealed. The heart of the world is thrilled by the prospect of one royal wedding with a genuine aura of romance. The heiress to the throne and her future husband met the British people. The king looking particularly happy, the queen and Princess Margaret joined the young couple. For their whole lives, the public's focus had been on Elizabeth and Margaret. But now, it was on Elizabeth and Philip. And Margaret was in the background. There was a mixture of jealousy. Margaret always wanted to be centre of attention. The fact that her, her sister's attentions were now diverted elsewhere towards this young Greek prince, I think, was a little bit confusing. 
I think it was hard for Elizabeth as well because although she was swept up in the excitement of romance and love and Philip, also she knew she was leaving behind her family, she was leaving behind her sister and things could never be the same again. So the old unity of Elizabeth and Margaret was broken and now it was Elizabeth and Philip and Margaret was on her own. Elizabeth, she knows that her life is set now. She will marry, one day she will be queen. But with Margaret, it's harder to see that. What will the second in line do? What will her future be? Very poignant for Elizabeth that part of her happiness really creates Margaret's unhappiness. The night before the wedding, the family had dinner together alone, before Elizabeth left Margaret to begin her new life. Thousands had assembled overnight, others had arrived at dawn, all eagerly waiting to see and to cheer the royal processions on this day of their own princess's marriage. And at Kensington Palace, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, with the Marquis of Milford Haven, his best man, checked the time for the start of his drive. A few moments too early, and then, lucky omen, a sweep stands by just before the bridegroom enters his car. The royal wedding took place on the 20th of November 1947 in Westminster Abbey. Margaret was chief bridesmaid. She took great care that her sister's train shouldn't catch on anything and was constantly straightening it. Princess Margaret leads the eight bridesmaids who have come to join the bridal pair. The king wrote a letter to Elizabeth after the wedding, saying, I can see that you are sublimely happy with Philip, which is right, but don't forget us. He added that he had lost something very precious and urged her that our family, us four, the royal family, must remain together. Not unusual for fathers to feel like that, but I think he, he of all people, felt it very keenly. The letter's interesting. He must have felt a pang of sadness that things would never be quite the same again. But it was Princess Margaret who felt the loss most of all. On the day of her wedding, Margaret actually went to her elder sister's room and opened the door and had a look and it was all empty. And she felt sad, she felt happy for her sister. But they didn't have very many other friends. They only really had each other. Suddenly her friend had gone, and I think she obviously felt lonely and rather dreaded the future. I think there's no doubt at all that Princess Margaret did feel very keenly the loss of her sister. Of course they were still part of the family, but nevertheless, for two sisters who'd, for 21 years, had been as close as close could be, the bond remained, but of course, there was that division now. Elizabeth and Philip had moved to Clarence House, and Elizabeth gave birth to their first child, Charles, in 1948. And this was an event of great excitement to Princess Margaret when she knew that he was going to be called Prince Charles. She said, I suppose I'll now be known as Charlie's aunt after this great theatre character. Margaret told friends that being known as Charlie's aunt was the title she was most proud of. But it couldn't make up for losing her sister. Elizabeth and Philip and them with baby Charles had their own lives. They also had official lives. And Margaret, until she became 18, was still the daughter of the house, the daughter at home. Without Elizabeth, Margaret was desperate for company and went out every night. There was a parting of the ways. Margaret was the party way, the irresponsible way. And I think that made up a little bit for missing her sister. Queen Mother recognized that with Elizabeth gone, Margaret was lonely. And so she really wanted Margaret to go out and have the fun that her elder sister had never been able to have because of the war years. Princess Margaret just loved having fun. Her grandmother, Queen Mary, said that she's so mischievous, she makes us laugh. <laughs> 
She was hugely entertaining character. She could make a party go with a swing. And the press loved photographing Margaret out on the town. He was the archetypal clown, the tears of a clown. She was fun, she was beautiful, she was exciting. At a party, everyone wanted to speak to her, but underneath it, there was a lot of pain and damage. 1948 was when she, she said to me, it was my coming out year. The print media wanted photographs at that time of only two women. One was the very beautiful actress Elizabeth Taylor. The other was the very beautiful Princess Margaret. She was becoming iconic. Everything that she did made front page news. When she was 19 and she was in Italy, the Italian press bribed the chambermaid so that they could go into her bedroom and describe what her lipstick was, what perfume she used. She kind of, if you like, didn't just come out, but took off. The press obsession with single, glamorous Margaret allowed Elizabeth to slip away to enjoy the quiet married life she'd always dreamed of, joining Philip on his new naval posting in Malta. When Elizabeth goes to Malta with Philip, it is her chance to live a normal life as really a normal naval wife, and she loves it. It's really a time that she looks back on as one of the happiest times of her life, that she can just be a naval wife. She has this idyllic world. There she could drive around in her own car and just go shopping like any other naval wife, go to polo matches, go dancing in the Phoenicia Hotel. It was very relaxed. Margaret is generating all the headlines in a way that enables her, her sister to live out this quieter, more private and secluded life in Malta. But Elizabeth's happiness was about to come to an abrupt end. King George's health was declining. Both his daughters stood in for him more and more on royal duties. And in 1952, Elizabeth and Philip rushed back from Malta to take the king and queen's place on a royal tour of the Commonwealth. The king and queen and Princess Margaret and others saw Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip off on the plane. Those images are the last images that we, the general public, see of the king. He didn't look well, and yet they can't have been expecting him to die as quickly. Otherwise, I don't think they would have sent Princess Elizabeth off on such a long tour. But it must have passed through their minds that they wouldn't see each other again. So those images are very poignant. A very warm-hearted reception had been prepared for Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh. And there was a special reception for schoolchildren on the lawns of Government House. The princess and the duke, driving slowly round so that all the 12,000 children could see them, received a tremendous welcome. On the 5th of February 1952, Margaret was home with her parents at Sandringham. They'd been out, they'd come back, they'd had dinner and everything was absolutely fine. Joking, laughing, having a lovely evening. And then the king retired to bed. And sometime during the early hours of the, the next day, the 6th of February, he died in his sleep. Nobody knows what time. And this, of course, was just totally, totally devastated Princess Margaret. She only had her mother to keep her company in the aftermath uh, of George VI's death separated, of course, from her older sister, who had always provided a sense of reassurance and leadership at times of crisis. The big difference between the two sisters is that with her father's death, Elizabeth is now queen. And with that role comes the business of queenship, duty, service, and public engagements. She has new roles to fulfill in the absence of her father. Margaret, on the other hand, doesn't have all of these, these roles to fulfill. Margaret felt completely alone. 
George VI had always spoiled his Princess Margaret. Uh, he'd had this very close relationship with Margaret. He is gone and she is bereft. She loved him dearly and writes later how much she missed him, how much a good man he had been. And instead, all she has for company now is her grieving mother. In my view, the great love of Princess Margaret's life was her father. She absolutely adored him. And his death, you know, bear in mind, she was only 21 years old. Just absolutely flawed her. She was devastated. But Margaret, through this whole period, was actually very much on her own. She was very much alone. And Princess Elizabeth, who of course had instantly become queen, was very much aware of this. She wrote to a friend saying that I have a husband, I have children, I have a job to do. But for my mother and sister, they will find it terribly lonely. It's really very difficult for Margaret and for the Queen Mother. All of a sudden, they're not important anymore. They were always the royal family. Now they're not. Now they're just also runs, and it's the Queen and Philip who are important. Margaret's importance has been completely displaced by her sister, and it's hard for Elizabeth to see her sister suddenly being sidelined. No one cares about Margaret anymore. All attention is on the Queen, Philip, Charles and Anne. The King's death was the greatest tragedy in Princess Margaret's life. She lost her mainstay, a father who adored her. She wept bitterly and couldn't sleep until prescribed sedatives. She described feeling like she was in a black hole and tunnel visioned. So we were having lunch on one occasion and she did say to me, Oh Christopher, I do wish you'd met my father. Even as an adult, she would still ask, why did he have to die so young? And she could get very emotional about it. She really could. Margaret actually went to pieces and she was totally in shock. She really didn't believe that he was going to die. And her sister wasn't there, her sister was married. And her mother was also in shock and grief. So she couldn't turn to her mother either. And for Margaret, her father's death had another very immediate impact on her day-to-day -day life. The veil victim was Princess Margaret, and people who saw her at the time were terribly, terribly sorry for her. She looked like an absolute wraith. Uh, suddenly, she'd lost everything. She, she would, of course, come to Windsor, Balmoral, and Sandringham again, but now as a guest. These had been her homes before. And of course, in due course, she would move out of Buckingham Palace and move into Clarence House with the Queen Mother from early 53 through till 1960 was not actually the best arrangement for her at all. For Elizabeth, it is different. She is above all the Queen and she has the crown and that takes precedence. And Elizabeth, who has always been the image of duty, now knows that if it comes between the crown and her love for her sister or her love for anyone else, the crown has to come first. Margaret was no longer just Elizabeth's sister. She was also her subject. And on the 2nd of June, 1953, the nation was gripped as 27-year-old Elizabeth Windsor was crowned at Westminster Abbey. This is the biggest moment of her life. Not only are all the world's eyes trained on her uh, at the centre of Westminster Abbey, she's also got her family staring down at her. And in the front row is her younger sister, Princess Margaret. I think Princess Margaret would have been aware that this was a hugely significant moment in her sister's life where she almost became an, another being. The moment of anointing, the moment of consecrating. It took her to another level, elevated her above all people. At the moment of the coronation, Elizabeth becomes divine. 
she actually grows another body. And this divine body is not the sister of Margaret. It is the queen. It is head of state. Lady Glen Connor, one of the maids of honor at the coronation, said to Margaret afterwards, you looked a bit sad. And she said, of course I'm sad, I'm losing my sister. Margaret stood alongside her mother. She must have thought to herself, this is what the new order looks like. Over 20 million people around the world watched the coronation as Elizabeth became the most famous woman on earth. Elizabeth crowned the head of a great family of nations. Long may she reign. But within 24 hours, it wasn't the Queen who was front page news. It was Margaret. And this time, there were no celebrations. The story that put her there would drive a wedge between the two sisters and cast a shadow over Elizabeth's first year on the throne. So in the lead up to the coronation in 1953, there are already rumours in Fleet Street amongst newspaper editors and journalists that Princess Margaret is romantically involved with a divorced man. And if you like, the, the journalists are looking for an opportunity to, to tell this story. The man was group captain Peter Townsend. And at the coronation, the press got the opportunity they'd been waiting for. In an act of complete spontaneity, she went up to him and brushed her white gloved hand over his lapel. This was an act of such intimacy that it had been picked up by journalists. That one act made headline news in the forum press, almost eclipsing the coronation itself. And that was the start of it. But while it may have been the start of it in public, in private, the romance had been going on for almost a year. Elizabeth had known about it, and so far hadn't stopped it. Peter Townsend had worked for their father and was a trusted member of the royal household. He was a famous Battle of Britain war hero. Everybody liked him. He was an incredibly nice man. I mean, I was lucky enough to know him a little bit in later life. He's a very gentle character, very courteous. But there was a major problem Elizabeth was wrestling with. Townsend was a divorcee. The very fact she was on the throne at all was because her uncle Edward VIII had been forced to abdicate to marry a divorcee. This, of course, put the Queen in a very difficult situation. She's now head of the family. She is temporal governor of the Church of England, a church that does not approve of divorce. So Elizabeth had asked Margaret to wait until after the coronation before making the relationship public. She was quietly hoping the love affair would have cooled off by then. In some ways it's almost the Queen saying to her sister, well are you quite sure you want to marry him? By having this year's gap if you like, it might fizzle out. Elizabeth knew her sister the best and understood this is what her father would have wanted her to do. You know, always look after little Margaret. And I think she always felt very responsible for Margaret and wanted to put her, a wing round her, as it were. Both the Queen Mother and the Queen, both Elizabeths, really thought that it was Margaret's fascination and infatuation with a much older man. It would blow over, nothing would happen. And so as a consequence, it wasn't stopped, it wasn't discussed, until it was far too late. Now the secret was out. Elizabeth could no longer resolve the tricky situation in private. With the cat out of the bag, the newspapers, politicians and even the church all waded in, debating whether a queen's sister should marry a divorcee. From this chink in the armour of the royal family uh, explodes the story. For months, the coronation has been dominating the press coverage uh, of the royal family, uh, and Elizabeth has been the central figure in that narrative. In the days and weeks immediately after the coronation, all of that attention switches onto Margaret. She becomes the story. 
But Elizabeth had yet another complication to consider. The Church of England bans marriage to divorcees. And there's even a law that forbids royals from the line of succession if they break this ban. It's clear that Elizabeth and Margaret are no longer just two sisters. They're now queen and subject. And the toughest challenge their relationship has ever faced is about to come to a head. Since childhood, Elizabeth and Margaret had been a perfect pair, but now Elizabeth was queen, everything was different. She could no longer give Margaret advice and support just as a big sister. Their relationship became subject to the law. Many of us are blocked from what we want in life, but it's very infrequently we feel necessarily it's our sibling that blocks us from this. The Royal Marriages Act says if you're in line to the throne, you must have the monarch's permission to marry until you're 25. Margaret was 23. To marry group Captain Townsend, she would need her sister to agree. And that would mean Elizabeth going against the teaching of the church that she was head of. The whole thing about the Queen is that she's so uncomplicated as, as a personality, as, as a character. She couldn't understand why her sister had to go and fall in love with a married man. You know, she just flummoxed, really. Elizabeth may have been puzzled by Margaret's choice, but she desperately wanted her sister to be happy. But now, as Queen, it wasn't just the church she had to listen to, it was also the government. One of the successes of the Queen is that she is very good at taking advice. If she asks for formal advice from the Prime Minister or the Foreign Secretary on a matter, and, the, and it is given, she will accept that advice. The only time the Queen has ever really spoken about being Queen was that she said she was thrown into it. She had no rule book except to do what her father had done. She kept all the old courtiers, most of whom were much, much, much older than her. She had a prime minister who was much older than her. Um, she was treading very carefully. The prime minister was 79-year-old Winston Churchill. He remembered the last royal marriage crisis between Edward VIII and Mrs. Simpson. And so did Tommy Lascelles, the Queen's private secretary. He was a relic from her father's court, and he definitely didn't approve of Townsend. There was a snobbishness at court regarding Townsend and Townsend's background. Though he had a, a sterling military record, he was ultimately a commoner. And not only that, he was a servant of the royal household. Uh, what should a, a royal servant be doing consorting with a princess? They don't agree uh, Townsend is a suitable choice for Margaret. Elizabeth was under huge pressure. While her advisers disapproved of the relationship, the public was very much on Margaret's side. The, the Daily Mirror announced a poll and out of 70,000 replies to the, to the poll, 68,000 replied saying she should be able to marry whoever she wants, whatever his background, whether he'd, he'd be divorced or not. So the, the public were very much on side. The Queen was in an impossible position. She had to decide, be a good Queen or a good sister. You see Elizabeth very torn because, of course, Margaret says to her, you can imagine, but you're the queen. You can change things. You're the most powerful woman in the country. And Elizabeth is being told over and over again, this is how things are done. This is how things must be. You can't change it. You can't change it just for your sister. You can't have a, an exemption for her. Things have to stay the same. In the weeks after the coronation, Tommy Lascelles and Churchill hatched a plan to send Townsend abroad on a posting to Brussels and ask the couple to wait two more years. In the meantime, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret are going off on an official visit to East Africa. What they do is to get rid of him two days before the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret come back to London. And Princess Margaret really minded that. She said, we were promised that We'd be able to say goodbye, that we were promised that he wouldn't go 
before I got back. Lascelles' plan was a blow to Margaret. But Elizabeth, young and new to the job, felt she had little choice but to agree. Margaret found it very difficult. Really, Peter Townsend had been someone she relied on. She missed him, she wasn't allowed to see him. For Elizabeth, the relationship of the sisterhood had been superseded by the Crown. But for Margaret, the relationship with the sisterhood was still paramount. So she was still thinking, but Elizabeth, you're my sister. I've done everything for you. I've always been supporting you. Where are you now? One of the problems for Princess Margaret was not having anybody to talk to. Elizabeth stepped back. She had to. She didn't want to give a personal lead. She couldn't give a personal lead. The situation was painful for Margaret. And for her sister, it made the difficult job of being a new young queen almost impossible. Well, the queen's not great at confrontation and she does compartmentalize things. She had two young children, a gorgeous young husband, and suddenly she was queen in a man's world. Very much a man's world. Despite her personal feelings, Margaret could see the pressure her sister was under. And so, with Townsend away, she decided to help Elizabeth. Margaret saw that her sister was really going to need her. You know, even if it was just a telephone call in the morning to cheer her up. And they did speak every day on the telephone. For the next 18 months, Margaret focused on her family. They spent time together at Royal Lodge Windsor with Charles and Anne they, and up at Balmoral. She was a very attentive aunt. The Queen always called her sister Margaret. And Charles, Anne, later Andrew and Edward, and William, Harry, all knew her as Margot. That was the family name. Margaret sort of took upon the role of helping her sister. And she was brilliant with the children. She absolutely adored Anne and Charles. She was the one that helped them and encouraged them with their schoolwork and made life fun for them. So I think she, she sort of f found a little role for herself. With Townsend in Brussels, Margaret had put her sister first and her love life second. Then, in August of 1955, she turned 25. Now she no longer needed Elizabeth's consent to marry. But things weren't that simple. Margaret knew that if she went ahead and married Townsend, there would be serious consequences. If she decided that she and Townsend were still going to marry, the only option would have been a civil marriage. And at that time, she would have lost her civil list income. She would have lost her role as a working member of the royal family. She would have lost her place in the line of succession. And critically for Margaret, she would no longer have been able to support her sister on public occasions. But there was a tiny glimmer of hope. There was a new prime minister, Anthony Eden, himself a divorcee. That summer he visited Balmoral, and Margaret's problem was one of the main subjects he discussed with the Queen. As Elizabeth and the Prime Minister wrestled with the issue, Margaret herself wrote to Eden. And she said there would be a lot of speculation about Peter Townsend, and she said he would be coming back on leave in October, and she hoped to see him. And she said, it's only by seeing him that I can decide whether I can marry him or not. On the 12th of October, 1955, Townsend returned to Britain. The tabloid journalists and photographers are following him everywhere. There's great speculation as to what it was they were talking about. What were, were Margaret and Townsend discussing? Was it a future together or was it a breakup? Over the days that followed, Margaret continued her royal duties. On the 21st of October, she watched her sister unveil a new statue of their father. In her speech, Elizabeth II describes how George VI, uh, despite personal reservations uh, when he became monarch, 
threw himself into the role and did his duty and put duty ahead of personal gratification. Uh, now, one way of reading that speech is as a, as, as a pointed criticism of Margaret and the fact that she was weighing up whether to do her duty or whether to put personal gratification first. Ten days after Townsend returned, the sisters met at Windsor with the rest of the family for a crisis conference. It could well be that she realised what the full implications might be. And the Queen Mother evidently said, and one thing they haven't thought about is where they might live. To which Prince Philip very curtly said, well, it is still possible to buy a house, you know. And the Queen Mother, in high dudgeon, got up and left the room, slamming the door after her. It was crunch time. Margaret realised by marrying Townsend, it would put a divorcee at the heart of the family and damage her sister's reputation. She had to be sure of her feelings before she made her decision. Two days later, Margaret returned to London for a critical meeting with Peter Townsend. She's got the doubts that the feeling isn't as strong as it was, and that was undoubtedly on both sides. You can picture the scene where they both say, look, love you very much, but it's not strong enough anymore. A week later, Townsend left London and Margaret released a statement ending months of speculation. She reaffirmed her commitment to her role as Princess Margaret, as someone who wanted to be part of the royal family. She made clear that duty was all and that personal desire had to come second. Princess Margaret had been brought up to be a princess and a working princess. It's a lot to give up. I think other members of the royal family have found this to their cost, and still do. In the end, Margaret making the decision to not marry Townsend, to stay single, took the heat off Elizabeth. She did what everyone wanted to do, and she had always been the girl who did what everyone told her not to do. She'd always been the one who'd broken the rules, who disobeyed. And now, really, she played the Elizabeth role, and she did it to save the monarchy and save her sister's face. Margaret had come to the decision that sitting next to her sister, not Townsend, was where she wanted to be. And a year later, in November 1956, when Queen Elizabeth opened Parliament, that was exactly where she was. Philip was away and Elizabeth was accompanied by Margaret and that sent a very powerful message, this really important moment of the monarch that you are at the state opening of Parliament. And Elizabeth is saying very clearly to everyone, despite the Townsend affair, Margaret and my relationship is exactly the same. Both sisters had put duty first. There's always an idea that the Townsend relationship caused some kind of rift. I mean, I was told by a former private secretary to the Queen that uh, from the Queen's official point of view, she would have wanted this over and done with, whichever way it was going to be, just get on with it. But it wouldn't, they did not cause a rift, so far as I'm aware, between the two sisters. But it was a lesson to them both. Now Elizabeth was queen, it would affect both their lives. Nothing Margaret did was private anymore. With the Townsend affair behind them, the late 1950s saw Queen Elizabeth on a whirlwind of official engagements, tours, and receiving lines as she began to find her feet as queen, sometimes with Margaret by her side. Princess Margaret, meanwhile, had more freedom, time for more than just royal duties, and the papers loved her for it. They were filled with stories of her parties and evenings with fashionable friends. But despite her sister's glamorous life, Elizabeth was worried. Margaret was still single. I think that Elizabeth had this dread that if Margaret didn't get married, it might be too late or the men might marry someone else. 
The Townsend affair had left its mark. But who should Margaret marry? By now, she was almost 30. She had to find somebody. When it came to potential bridegrooms, there was an awful lot of media speculation about who would Princess Margaret marry. Would it be Sonny Blandford, the Marquis of Blandford, the heir to the Duke of Marlborough? Would it be Johnny Dalkeith, the Earl of Dalkeith, the heir to the Duke of Buccleuch? You know, one of these very grand aristocratic marriages. But it wasn't a prince, duke or earl that caught Margaret's eye. It was a good-looking society photographer and designer. And his name was Tony Armstrong Jones. At first, the relationship was a secret, even from her sister. He is everything that sort of goes against royal protocol. He is extremely fun-loving. He is a bohemian. He's had reportedly relationships with men and women by this point. Uh, he's, um, he's something of a, of a Lothario. He's, he's a real hit with his friends. Uh, and he lives a, a sort of a seedy life on the, on the edges of, 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 of proper society. He's, he's very much of the 60s. And this is very different. This is a very brave move on the part of Princess Margaret. Margaret's last relationship almost caused a constitutional crisis. How would the world react to her new lover? And most importantly, would her sister approve? After the scandal of her last affair, Margaret hoped her sister would approve of Anthony Armstrong Jones. He was an unconventional, even shocking choice for a princess. But he wasn't divorced, and Elizabeth knew her government couldn't object. Above all, she could see he made her sister happy. Desperate for Margaret to settle down, Elizabeth encouraged the relationship. She even asked Tony to redesign a building at Sandringham. And when Tony delivered the design, it was the perfect opportunity to ask permission to marry her sister. The princess said, can you imagine what the footman must have thought? Because the queen pressed the button for her page and said, please ask Mr. Armstrong Jones to bring in his model. So in he went and Margaret was there and the queen mother was there and the doors closed. And suddenly, whoops of laughter and cheers and all the rest of it that the queen had said yes of course you can marry and all the rest of it what must the footman have thought that mr for mr armstrong jones just bringing in his model i think elizabeth and the royal family were really quite pleased by tony the royal family felt that all their guilt over the townsend affair could be washed over because here was the number one here was mr wright this seemed to really say to everyone you all made the right decision around the townsend affair elizabeth was happy for her sister and margaret and her new husband soon became the toast of the town princess margaret and tony armstrong jones who then became earl of snowden of course were the royal families the monarchy's golden couple they encompassed all the glamour that anybody could want when it came to royalty. Here you'd got this incredibly beautiful princess who was at really at the height of her popularity, you know. And everything they did made news. Everybody wanted to breathe the same air as Margaret and Tony. By 1964, Margaret and Tony had two children. To the world, they were the picture postcard family. But Margaret was still a working princess with a job to do. She, like her sister, needed a husband who could cope with the pressures of royal duties. Elizabeth had made a good choice. One of the interesting things about the Queen, by choosing Prince Philip, in a sense she chose somebody her own size. I mean, it's a very balanced relationship. The Queen's marriage has been obviously incredibly powerful and strong. They're like two great big oak trees side by side. But after two years, it was becoming obvious that Tony wasn't prepared to follow his wife around. He was itching to do something. He did not want to be, for the rest of his life, Mr Princess Margaret. He didn't want to be going 
opening hospitals, visiting factories, going to film premieres. This was not what he wanted at all. And it was the Queen and Princess Margaret who actually said, well then for goodness sake, go back to work. But despite this concession, the marriage began to flounder. Snowden and Margaret's relationship was very, very passionate, but it, it quickly became toxic and he treated her very badly. He had a lot of affairs and he didn't keep them secret. And even when he was with Margaret, he was really, really unkind to her. He used to leave these really nasty little notes around the house. Nasty and carefully thought out cruelty. In private, the marriage was going from bad to worse, but Margaret and Snowden tried to hide it from her sister. The Queen probably felt that it was arguments and it was disagreements, and those were normal in a marriage. It was not the same as the fact that Snowden clearly wanted out of the marriage and was, it was creating this quite toxic relationship. She would just advise Margaret just to keep trying because that's what she always says. And she's the one that always says, no, 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 please no divorce, just, you know, just try and work at it. Just try for another two years, give it time. But I don't think that the Queen would never have any idea of how vicious and nasty it was. The Queen assumed it was her sister being difficult. When they were children, Margaret had been demanding and liked to be centre of attention. The Queen and the Queen Mother were very fond of Tony. We can see a link back to the naughty princess, the trickster, the prankster, Margaret wanting things her way. There was a feeling within the family, unfairly, that this was all Margaret's fault. Elizabeth didn't realise the depth of Margaret's unhappiness. When Princess Margaret was at her most desperate, the Queen would try and joke her out of it a bit. And instead of saying, oh, poor darling, poor darling, and put her arm round her, she would make a joke, say, now, come on, Margaret. You know, you can't jump out of the window, you're on the ground floor. Margaret had often relied on her sister, but now she was isolated from both her sister and her husband. She was desperate to escape. And when her friends gave her a house on the island of Mystique, she had the perfect place to run away to. Mystique came to symbolize freedom away from public life. It was her sort of hideaway, uh, somewhere where she could get away from all of the, the prurient uh, press attention and coverage uh, that she'd come to, to, to hate. Now on this island, it's an opportunity, yes, it's an escape, but it provides her with an opportunity to be regal, to be the total authority, to design her circumstances in the way in which she wishes, and she does. While Elizabeth ruled at home, Mustique was Margaret's empire, but gradually her escape turned into something more. Mustique became her party island, she was having fun again. But before long, the tabloids caught on. This was a bad time for a royal marriage to be seen to be on the rocks. A bad time to be pictured living it up on the beach. It was the 1970s and Britain was struggling. There is poverty, there are power cuts, uh, there is destitution, there are national strikes. And then we have images on the front page of the uh, tabloid newspapers of Princess Margaret enjoying herself on the beaches in Mustique. Shock, horror. But if Margaret thought all the fuss would die down, she was wrong. Margaret's behavior even fueled questions in Parliament. Demands were made to cut off her allowance to reduce the cost of the monarchy. The Queen refused. But something else was about to test the Queen's loyalty to her little sister. Rejected by her husband, Margaret had taken a new lover, Roddy Llewellyn. Seventeen years her junior. Once again, Princess Margaret's love life was front page news. When it became public, there was a huge amount of 
a criticism about this. You know, here you've got Princess Margaret becoming involved with a man 17 years her junior, her toy boy. She was called a kept woman at a floozy in Parliament. The Queen was not happy about this, and she said words to the effect, what are we going to do about my sister's gutter snipe life? And there was even talk within Number 10 Downing Street. Should she be taken off the civil list? And if this is, you know, if this is the life that she wants, what should happen? I don't think the Queen was too sold on that idea. But even Elizabeth felt her sister had gone too far. Her lifestyle was threatening the reputation of the royal family. She decided enough was enough. The palace released a statement. Margaret and Snowden's marriage would end. The sisters had been brought up to think divorce spelt disaster for the royal family. And now, the worst had happened. The Queen hoped that this would be an end of it. But the press wouldn't leave Margaret alone. There's a degree of double standards. If, he'd been, if it had been an older man with a younger woman, he would have been on the front page and, and perhaps paraded for his virility. But this was an older woman. And so the press, at the time, sort of chastised her for lack of morality. Few people have suffered more than you from wild and inaccurate and irresponsible press stories, especially in foreign papers. Can you laugh at them or do you find them aggravating? I find them extremely aggravating. I think since the age of 17 I've been misreported and misrepresented. They're not worth denying, really, because they're usually inaccurate. For decades, the press had been obsessed with Margaret's private life, and it had often caused tension between her and her sister. Now, as she entered her fifties, Margaret had a tough choice to make. Would she choose happiness in her private life, or would she again give it up for her sister and the crown? In 1980, Margaret turned 50, and Elizabeth was 54. Margaret was divorced, and within a year, she parted company with Roddy. Seemingly unable to have a private life without it damaging her sister, she resigned herself to remaining single. Margaret's attempt to support the monarchy, her dutiful nature, the fact she gave up Townsend, the fact she tried to stay in this toxic, abusive marriage with Snowden, that isn't always seen or supported, it isn't always said. Well, Margaret sacrificed so much, she's seen as more selfish, but that wasn't the case. She tried everything to support the monarchy and really, in, at a very young age, pretty much sentenced herself to be the single woman who supported the Queen and did little else but support the Queen and look after her children for the rest of her life. She withdraws back into the family fold of the broader royal family. Um, we see her, uh, her, her basically say, enough is enough in terms of the sensation, enough of the gossip, enough of the scandal. From now on, Margaret would stand beside her sister, back to the way they used to be. Margaret, despite her partying, her smoking, her drinking and her dramas, had great respect for the institution of the monarchy and a great respect for her sister being the head of the monarchy by being queen. During the 1980s and 90s, Margaret went into royal overdrive, supporting her sister in an endless round of duties. Princess Margaret's commitment to her official engagements was total. She said that she, she never wanted just to be a name on a letterhead. There was no point. The occasion when I saw them together was an event at Kensington Palace. There was a long staircase and I was at the top to greet them. And as they walked up, they, they looked like two sisters with a complete rapport. 
you know, sisters enjoying each other's company and having a gossip and a, a giggle. The interesting thing was they then separated and, and worked the room in different ways. But it was very clear that Princess Margaret was keeping an eye on the Queen because they finished their lines at exactly the same time um, and therefore were able to leave at exactly the same time and one wasn't waiting for the other. The sisters had been brought up to believe in their duty to the crown and in the end, for Margaret, this meant duty to her sister. Princess Margaret did 200 events in my time and at each one she'd have met 50 people and so that's 10,000 people, complete strangers that she would make small talk to. And after a while I thought, she can't actually enjoy that. It, it can't be pleasurable. And you have to think, why would she have done that unless it was a sense of duty to the Queen? When the Queen was in her late 60s, she had to endure the very public breakdown of her children's marriages. And Margaret was there for her. I think the sisters became closer when uh, everything started to go very wrong for the Queen. She was in those very traumatic years of the 90s. Diana had always been very close to Margot. She, she adored Margot. To start off with, she and Diana got on extremely well. There was an occasion when Diana had a jacuzzi, a jacuzzi, as Princess Margaret put it, jacuzzi. And Diana wanted her to see it, and the princess thought this was so brilliant that she wanted a jacuzzi as well. They, they were very close to one another, until it all started to go wrong with, between Diana and Charles. When she saw that Diana's behaviour was bringing the monarchy into disrepute, she, she was angry because that, the monarchy was her sister. Margaret thought that Diana wasn't doing the right thing, that she thought that this was disrespectful to the Queen, to the idea of monarchy. And that's when there was the cutoff. If she felt that you were in any way letting the Queen down, being disrespectful to the Queen, betraying the Queen, that was it. She was always there. And I think she tried to, to help her sister to see how difficult life was for, for her children and how sometimes it was better to just say, well, look, forget it and let them get on with it, then let, them, let them divorce, let them part. And um, you know, it's, it's just life's rich pattern, really. And just because you're royal doesn't mean it can't happen to you. As Margaret got older, her health got worse. And it was her big sister who looked after her again. We know that as Princess Margaret's health deteriorated, that the Queen asked her press secretary to basically get in touch with uh, the, the, the press editors and the, the journalists in the UK to stop the interest in her sister. On the 9th of February 2002, Margaret died in hospital in London. She was 71. Elizabeth had lost her sister and her best friend. <laughs> 
loss of Margaret was really cataclysmic to the Queen. It was very, very painful. The Queen did see that Margaret's health had been put under strain by what had been denied to her emotionally. It's a very lonely place being sat atop a throne and to have a companion, to have a confidant who you can confide in and who you can tell your secrets to uh, and who shares in that life with you, I think was extremely important to both women. Even after her death, the press still painted Margaret as a rebellious chain-smoking party-goer. But the truth is, much of her life was a dutiful one. By the time of her death, she'd been patron of 42 charities and had carried out 99 official visits overseas and thousands of royal engagements. Above all, she stood by Elizabeth, supporting her all her life. When we look back at the, the, the princesses' lives together, we could say that Margaret did end up sacrificing quite a lot. In some cases, she had given up something that she had wanted to maintain the strength of the monarchy and her sister's reign. Margaret didn't choose to sacrifice all for the crown because she loved the crown above all. She chose it because she loved her sister above all. She wasn't sacrificing for the crown, she was sacrificing for her sister. It was an unbreakable bond in a way that it's probably difficult for anyone outside the royal family to understand because their life is so unique and so different and basically so dedicated to duty and in a way destroyed by the fact that they're always on public show. So only Margaret would really know how that felt. Margaret's funeral took place 50 years to the day that her father had been laid to rest in the same place. I was privileged enough to be asked to go to the princess's funeral at St George's Chapel at Windsor. Both Snowden and Roddy Llewellyn attended the funeral. Margaret's choice of men had strained the sisters' relationship, but finally Elizabeth could see them through her sister's eyes, and not just as a queen. After the princess died, the queen did say to Lady Glen Connor, who had been instrumental in introducing them, that thank you for introducing Roddy to Princess Margaret because it was an important relationship to the princess. Seven weeks after Margaret died, the Queen also lost her mother. When the Queen uh, made her public broadcast to thank people for their tributes to her mother, she also said privately that she couldn't have mentioned her sister. She couldn't have got through it. The royal princesses had supported each other through a lifetime of change. Together, they had faced public crisis, war, press attacks, and scandal. But despite their many ups and downs, they'd remained the closest of friends, divided by history, but united by love.